Good morning. I am Ashika Townsend, Integrated Marketing Officer at the Jamaica Business Development Corporation. Welcome to another episode of the JBBC's Virtual Bizone. Today we are completing the Intellectual Property Series with Trademark Anywhere, Understanding the Madrid Protocol with Ms. Adrienne Thompson, the Director and Registrar, registrar sorry, of the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office. Adrienne Thompson is an attorney at law with over 16 years of professional experience gained in the fields of intellectual property and medicinal chemistry research. She was admitted to the Jamaican Bar in 2013, recognized to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office in 2009, and licensed to practice law in Missouri, USA in 2008. She holds a Juris Doctorate from the Tulane University Law School, Louisiana, and a Bachelor of Arts in Biochemistry from Vassar College, New York. Of course, today's episode will be recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel by the latest Friday. You can also get highlights from this episode on our Instagram page at JBDC Jamaica. Over to you, Ms. Adrienne Thompson. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, Adrienne. I'm hearing you. Okay. So thank you so much for having me. And so today, like you said, we're gonna talk about um, trademarking using the Madrid protocol um, and learning a little bit more about trademarks and how they operate. Let's talk about trademarks and the Madrid protocol. And I'm gonna ask, um, if you can hold your questions until the end and then we can um, take care of them in the Q&A session. Okay. So just briefly about JIPO. So the Jamaica Intellectual Property Office is the government agency with responsibility for administering IP laws in Jamaica. Um, we are an agency under the Ministry of Industry, Investments and Commerce. And what we do here at JIPO is we assist um, proprietors with registering their intellectual property rights. And so that covers a wide range of IP rights that we're gonna go into more detail um, shortly, but that includes trademark registration. Um, we also do a, a fair amount of public education and work on developing IP policy and updating the various IP laws. So what is intellectual property? So basically intellectual property um, are legal rights that accrue from creations of the mind. So any kind of intellectual activity in any field that is put in some kind of tangible form, chances are it can be protected by one or more IP rights. And so what IP rights do is they grant the owner of the intellectual property exclusive rights to dictate how their work is used. And so if you have IP rights, you can prevent people from copying your intellectual property. And if someone uses your intellectual property without your author authorization, then you can essentially sue them for infringement of your IP rights. So when we speak of intellectual property, there are um, various categories of IP. And so you have under the umbrella, umbrella of industrial property, that's where trademarks, designs, patents, and geographical indications fall. And then you also have copyright and related rights that are used to protect things like artistic and musical works, um, programming, broadcasting would fall under the umbrella of copyright and related rights. And then you have also another area of traditional knowledge. And so what traditional knowledge relates to is communal intellectual property that belongs to a community. So for example, 
um, in the case of the Rastafarian community, um, certain practices or certain marks or certain terms would be considered a traditional knowledge or traditional cultural expression of that community. And so there's a separate area of intellectual property that's used to protect that type of creation. Okay, but today we're here to talk about trademarks. And so I guess, you know, we should start with what a trademark is. What is the definition of a trademark? What is its function? And so ultimately a trademark is a sign or a logo that is used to distinguish the goods or services of one enterprise from those of another enterprise or their competitors. And so you apply your trademark to your goods or services to essentially signal to the consumer that these goods or services are associated with your business and have a particular level of quality or reputation. That's the power of a trademark. And so they are essentially the face of your brand and of your business. So just generally, in order for a trademark to be registered, it has to serve the function of being a trademark in that it has to be a source identifier. So when the consumer interacts with this sign, they're supposed to be able to say, yes, these goods or services come from ABC Enterprise. And so in order for a trademark to do that, it has to be distinctive for the products or services involved. So what that means is, is that it can't be descriptive of the goods or services, and it can't be a generic term that everybody who are providing those goods or services would use. What it's supposed to do is it's supposed to signal that these goods or services come from company A as opposed to company B. So an example of a common descriptive word would be um, the word apple or fruit. So if somebody was selling apples and they decided that their trademark was going to be apple, well, that's descriptive of the goods that you're selling. And it's also a term that other competitors would need to use to describe the goods on sale. And so it can't function as a trademark for fruit. However, I'm sure you're all familiar with Apple, the trademark for computer products and services and it's one of the most popular trademarks in the world. And so in the context of a computer software and hardware, the term Apple is distinctive because it has nothing to do with fruit. So those are things to think about when you're coming up with your trademarks for your business. Am I just describing what's in the bottle or am I trying to signal to people that he these goods or services come from my enterprise. Um, another important point for a trademark to be registered, it can't be identical or similar to a trademark that is already registered and it's being used for similar products or services. And so when you're applying for your trademarks, uh, we recommend that you do a clearance search to determine whether or not what you're thinking of using as your trademark has already been taken by somebody else in the space or if it's free and clear and you can use it for your business. Okay, so trademark registration options. So the thing to know about trademarks is that they're territorial. So where you register your trademark, those are the boundaries of your IP right. So if you protect your trademark in Jamaica, then your trademark is enforceable in Jamaica only. You can't sue somebody in Antigua for infringement of your Jamaican trademark. If you're planning to sell your goods in Antigua, then you will also 
it would be prudent for you to register your trademark in Antigua as well in order for you to be able to bring infringement actions. And so there are several ways that you can go about registering your trademark in the various territories. So you have the national route, and that's where you go to the IP office of each country that you want protection in. You'd come to Jamaica, you go to Antigua, if you're interested in the US, you'd go there, or you have the regional route. And so, for example, if you're interested in selling your products in Europe and you would like a regional trademark application, then you can go to the EU IPO and get a regional trademark that would apply. So it's essentially a regional office. There are also regional offices in Africa. So you have Aripo and OAPI, or you have a Benelux trademark that you know, covers three countries. So there's a regional route depending on where you're planning to sell your goods. And finally, there's the international route, which is what we're focused on today. And that's where you're filing through the Madrid protocol. So the thing to remember is that whichever route you're going, at the end of the day, the trademark that you obtain is going to give you protection in the territory that you register in. So all of these routes are just different ways of obtaining protection in the various territory. Okay, so the Madrid Protocol, it's like I said before, it's a way for you to register your trademark in foreign territories. Um, and procedurally, it's easier than using the national route where you're going country to country because you're essentially filing one application, you're paying one set of fees, and you're then designating what territories you're trying to protect your trademark in. Um, it can be cheaper than filing several national applications worldwide. Um, and like I said, it's procedurally just simpler because you're not dealing with various languages. Um, and you know there is a centralized filing and management procedure. So because you're dealing primarily with the World Intellectual Property Office, then you don't have to be going country to country to keep up on, okay, when did I file this application? When is it going to expire? When do I need to pay this renewal fee for all the various territories that you've sought protection in? Once you're under the Madrid system, it's like, centralized management of your trademark portfolio. So that's one of the benefits of the Madrid Protocol. Okay, so how does the Madrid system work? So basically there are three stages to the Madrid system. So at the first stage, that's when you're going to submit your international application to your local office. So if you are in Jamaica and you're thinking of exporting overseas, then, and you want to protect using the Madrid protocol, you're going to fill out your international application, come to JIPO, submit it to JIPO, so that's stage one. Now, in order to use the Madrid system, it's a closed system. So not everybody is entitled to use the system you're going to have to have a basic application that's essentially going to be your, your pass to get access to, the, to using the Madrid system. And so that basic application has to be a locally um, registered trademark or a local application at JIPO. So you need to have a national application in order for it to be the foundation for your international application. So that's stage one. So once you submit to that international application, the office of origin, so that would be JIPO, we're going to certify that what um, your international application corresponds to your parent mark or your basic mark. And once that happens, then we will forward your international application to WIPO or the World Intellectual Property Office, who is essentially 
going to be administering all of these international trademarks. And that stage two, where WIPO is going to essentially examine your international application to see if it has, you know, all the necessary formalities for all of the territories that you designate. Um, assuming that it does that, WIPO then publishes the international uh, application in their journal, it's the, the Gazette, and that is essentially going to notify all of the territories that you've designated that, hey, here is this application that person X is seeking, and they've selected your country. So at that essentially opens you to stage three of the process where then these designated contracting parties. So all of the territories that you select, they're then going to look at your application and see if it passes muster under their local laws. And assuming that it does, they will then um, grant you a statement of protection in that territory, or essentially they'll register your trademark in their territory. So that's the system in a nutshell. That's a quick overview. And so let's just go over the different stages and things to remember. So remember stage one is where you're filing the application and you're going through your um, office of origin, which for locals would be JIPO. And so, like I said before, you have to have a basic application. So you need to have a local application registered or filed at JIPO. That's going to be the jump off point for your international application. You also need to be entitled to use the system. And so you need to have a real and effective um, industrial or commercial establishment in Jamaica, you have to be a Jamaica national, or you have to be domiciled in Jamaica if you're going to use JIPO as your office of origin. To gain access to the Madrid system, you have to be entitled, you have to have a basic mark. So once you submit that international application through JIPO, we're going to certify and forward it to the International Bureau at WIPO for them to examine your application. Okay, so because you need to have a basic mark, you need to have a local application or registration, how do you go about getting this local registration at JIPO? Because that's essentially before stage one, that's the real first step. So it's a similar process. You're going to fill out the application form. You're going to tell us what is this sign? What is the logo or symbol that you're intending to use as your trademark? You also have to tell us what goods or services you're planning to use this trademark with. Um, and you're gonna have to give us an example, a representation of the mark. What do you want this thing to look like? At which point, JIPO is going to examine your application and see if it passes muster under the Trademark Act and rules. If it does and we accept the mark, then we will publish the mark in our trademark journal, um, at which point there is a two month opposition period where the general public can oppose the registration of your trademark. If there is no opposition, then the mark will proceed to registration. And that's how you get your local registration at JIPO that you're gonna use um, as the basic mark for your international application. So the fees for the local registration for registering a trademark in one class the initial application fee is $7,800. Now for every additional class, there is an additional $2,200 per class. Okay, so what is this class thing? What does that mean? So like I said, you're using your trademark on various goods or services. And so 
how that is managed in the trademark system is you use a classification system. And so if you are using your trademark on cosmetic goods, for example, then that would be in Nice classification class three. If you are going to use your trademark on clothing or footwear, then that would be class 25. So there are up to 45 classes under the NIS classification system. And so whatever goods or services you're offering, there is a class for it. And so that's where you're gonna essentially designate what classes you're planning to use a trademark on. And if it happens to fall in more than one class, then your registration fee goes up. Um, and that's not unique to Jamaica, that's in trademark systems across the world. So if you're planning to register um, in the US, then it's a similar classification system. So, so it's important to think about when you're applying, what are the goods or services that I'm offering and what do I really want to protect? Because you know, it's very expensive to just have a trademark covering all classes of goods and services. And it's not very realistic because there is no one business that tends to offer goods and services in all 45 classes. Okay, so once we accept the mark and it proceeds to registration, then you pay an additional $10,000. And that $10,000 is for the publication and registration of the mark. And so to register a trademark in one class from start to finish is currently $17,800. Um, please note that the trademark fees are going to increase shortly once the trademark amendments rules go into effect. Um, and we expect that to happen by the end of the summer, then all of these fees are going to increase. And so if you're thinking about applying for a trademark and you're on the bubble, now is the time to pull the trigger before the new fees kick in and you know it becomes a lot more expensive to register. Just something to note. Okay, so back to stage one, how do you go about doing all of this fanciness? So it's just like your local application, you're gonna fill out an international application and you're gonna submit it through JIPO. And so you can find the Madrid application assistant that's going to assist you in filling out this international application form. I have the link in the slides. Um, and so you're going to essentially fill out that form using the assistance, and then it's going to generate a PDF that you're then going to print and bring to JIPO for us to essentially forward this international application to the International Bureau. Um, so you have to submit the international application along with the handling fee. So that handling fee is 15,000 Jamaican dollars. And then in terms of the actual filing fees, those are payable directly to the World Intellectual Property Office. But we'll talk about fees next slide, next couple of slides. So we covered this already. WIPO is going to conduct examination and assuming that you pass formalities examination, they're going to essentially publish your mark in the international register and send a notification to the designated contracting parties to say that you've submitted this international application. Who are then going to examine your international application at stage three of the process and so this is where they're going to substantially examine under each local law, whether or not your trademark passes muster. And so that's where they're going to check, is this mark distinctive for the goods and services here? Is there somebody in this territory that's already using the mark? And so you essentially have to prosecute the application before the IP office of the territory that you designate in stage three. Um, 
IP offices under the Madrid protocol have to give you a decision within 12 to 18 months from when you file their application, file the international application, whether or not they're going to accept or refuse to protect your mark. Um, if they accept it, you'll get a statement of grant of protection that is going to essentially be your registration certificate for that territory. Um, your international registration is valid for 10 years, which is the same as, you know, our local registration. Trademarks are valid for 10 years, and you can renew them indefinitely as long as you're still using them for your business. Okay, so here is the fee slide. And so these are the fees that are payable to WIPO. So you're going to pay directly to WIPO. Um, they have a fee calculator where you can see what the fees are depending on which country you designate. So in the same way that if you select more than one class because you're offering a wide variety of goods and services, the cost goes up. The cost for your trademark is going to go up depending on how many territories you designate that you want to seek protection in. And so, there is a basic fee um, that's payable to WIPO that includes three classes of goods and services. Once you go over three classes, then you're paying additional fees on top of that. Um, so that basic fee essentially gets you before WIPO. And then you have the fees that the designated contracting parties, you have to pay them through WIPO. And so, Depending on the country, they might have standard fees or individual fees. And so there's no way for me to tell you what the fee is going to be depending on which combination of countries that you select. And so that's why I'm directing you to the um, fee calculator. One second. Okay, just... Give me one moment. Okay, so the thing to note about these fees is that there are no local attorney, attorney fees included in all the fees here. And so when you use the Madrid fee calculator, that doesn't include local attorney fees. And so even though it might seem exorbitant at the jump, Remember that if you're going country to country, you're going to have to pay not only the fee to apply to register in each territory, but you're going to have to pay local attorney fees, most likely to file those applications for you in each territory. So that's something to think about when you're deciding whether or not to use the Madrid system. Okay, so... Um, one of the questions that we get often at JIPO is as follows. I've already applied for or registered my trademark at JIPO. And so with the Madrid protocol, am I auto automatically registered overseas in all Madrid protocol territories? And uh, I'm hoping that based on the presentation, you know that the answer is no. So basically, you need to file an international application. So just because we have access to the Madrid system now, it doesn't mean that you're automatically protected internationally. There are steps to take if you want to protect your trademark in overseas territories. And so, like I said, for Jamaicans in Jamaica, you need to have a trademark application or registration at JIPO first in order to be able to use the system. And so in conclusion, it's important for you to protect your trademark in the territory that you are essentially doing business. And so it's important to think about your export markets, your potential export markets, and you know, think about how you're going to obtain protection for your intellectual property in these markets. So like I said, there are various routes to obtain protection. You can go the national route, 
can go to regional routes if you happen to be seeking protection in Europe or one of the other regions with our regional office, or you can use the Madrid protocol to essentially obtain protection in multiple jurisdictions using one process. So that is essentially the Madrid protocol and how you use it in a nutshell. And so now I will take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Adrienne Thompson for that very heavy presentation it was very um, informative. If you have any questions, you can drop it in the chat or you can stick your hands up and open your mic and Ms. Adrienne will definitely address them. So one person is asking, is there a regional registration for the Caribbean? No, there isn't a regional registration for the Caribbean yet. Um, they're working on that at CARICOM, but there one currently doesn't exist. Another person says, another person says, boy, this looks sticky for the average SME, but there is a hand up in the, is this Adrian Campbell? Abraham, Abraham Campbell. Abraham, you can go ahead. Yes, yes, I just unmuted a while ago. Um, can we just file an application to wipe up without have to go through Drypo? No. So like I said, it's a closed system. And so you need to have a, a basic application at Drypo before yeah. you can gain access to the Wipo system. Okay, is there any other questions? Someone in the chat says, can another Caribbean island apply for a JIP for registration? Can a, somebody in another territory apply for a yes, to Caribbean protect their island. trademark in Jamaica? Sure. So you can always, like I said, use the national route, which is where that person would just need to get a local agent to file an application here at JIPO. Or if they're going to go through the Madrid system, then the territory that they're in would also need to be a party to Madrid, right? And so in terms of the Caribbean, I believe Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua, and I'm not sure if Suriname joined yet. But I believe those two are the only ones that are currently members of the system. The other territories aren't parties to Madrid yet. So they wouldn't be able to use the Madrid protocol to file. So they'd need to use the Madrid route, the national route to protect their trademarks locally. Similarly, if you're seeking protection in the region, then currently you can only use the Madrid system to gain protection in territories that are party to the treaty. And so you can designate Antigua, you can designate Trinidad, I believe you can designate Suriname. I believe Belize is like on the cusp of joining. But you know, if you go to the WIPO website, you'll see the list of territories that you can select. Um, that's also in the fee calculator. Also, you can get an idea of how much it is. But yeah, there aren't a ton of Caribbean territories that are party to, treat, party to the Madrid Treaty as yet. Thank you for that, Adrienne. There's another question here that says, how long does the registration last before expiration? 10 years. So you're protected for 10 years um, and you can choose to renew that in various territories. Um, another benefit that I didn't mention is that you can um, subsequently designate a territory. So, for example, let's say you have your international uh, registration, but then all of a sudden your business takes off and you suddenly start exporting to Mexico. When you 
you know, initially filed the application, you didn't designate Mexico because you weren't exporting to them. But, you know, business is booming. Mexico is now one of the top markets. You can subsequently designate Mexico to add them to your international protection. So that's another service that WIPO offers. So the next question is, are there different benefits to applying in different territories, such as applying in St. Lucia versus Jamaica? So the benefits, so like I said, trademarks are territorial. So you protecting your trademark in Jamaica essentially allows you to sue people for infringing that trademark in Jamaica only. If you want to protect your trademark in St. Lucia, then you need to register your trademark in St. Lucia. And so how you get protection in St. Lucia is a procedural question, but substantively, at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're trying to get protection in all of these territories where you have your business, where you're selling your goods or services, because that's where people are going to infringe them. And so if you're doing business in St. Lucia, then it would be prudent for you to obtain protection in St. Lucia because St. Lucia isn't a party to the Madrid Treaty. And the only way for you to get protection in St. Lucia is to go the national route, which is essentially to go to the IP office in St. Lucia and apply to register your trademark in that territory. Okay, and then the final question um, relating to the question that asks when the, um, the registration expires says, within that 10 years, can you make adjustments to the classes as well during the time? Can you make adjustments to the classes? Um, so you can make limited adjustments, but you, you can't make it wider. So you can't expand the scope of your protection. And that's also in a national application. You can't make the initial trademark offer you protection wider than what you initially applied for. So if we see that, for example, you started off selling perfume and then, I don't know, something happened and now you're selling perfume and engine oil, and of course, at the beginning, <laughs> engine oil wasn't on your initial application, then chances are you're going to have to um, file another application to protect that, those additional goods. But yeah, it depends on the territory and it depends on what kind of adjustments you're making. So you can make it narrower, but that's just one limitation. You can make it wider than what you initially had. Thank you so much, Adrienne. Um, thank you for joining this session. It's recorded. You can find the recording at YouTube on our page at JBDC Jamaica. And join us July for our next session and in the virtual be soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me.